You will hear a conversation about a language course. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning, Borgheimer Language Courses. How may I help you? Oh yes, I contacted you some time ago about following a German course in Germany, and you advised me to take your placement test before we go any further. Well, I've done that now, so I'd like to go ahead with booking the course for this summer, if that's possible. Certainly, sir. You said you took the placement test. What was the result? I was placed at the O3 level. O3, right. That's lower intermediate. Fine, Mister. The answer is level three or lower intermediate. So the course level has been filled in for you. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to five. Peterson, John Peterson. Could you spell that for me, please, Mr. Peterson? P, E, double T, E R, double S O N. That's a double T and a double S. Am I right? That's right. Now, could I ask you where the course takes place? Well, we offer courses in Hamburg and Berlin. For your level, there's never a problem. There are always plenty of people for the intermediate classes. Oh dear, does that mean that there might be a lot of students in my class? I wouldn't be very happy about that. No, don't worry, Mr. Peterson. The maximum class size is twelve, but I've never known there to be more than nine or ten in a class. It could even be five or six. Good. Actually, I'd prefer to study in Berlin. And how long is the course? Three weeks, five hours a day, two hours only on Saturday, Sundays free. I see. And what about accommodation? There you have a choice, Mr. Peterson. You can either stay with a German family who are used to having such guests, or you can stay on the university campus. Or we can book you into a nearby bed and breakfast. Is there a big difference in price? Not really. Staying with the family works out the cheapest, and the bed and breakfast is a bit more money. Staying on the university campus comes somewhere between the two price-wise, but Berlin is not too expensive anyway. Which do you recommend? Well, if you want to practice your German and be part of a German family, I would recommend staying with a family. Our families are all hand-picked, and we've never had any sort of complaint. Yes, I'll probably do that then. What are the dates of the course? The first summer course starts on the first of June in Hamburg, and a week later in Berlin. Which is what would concern you, as you have chosen the Berlin course. That's the eighth of June. The next course would begin on the second of July, and then the second of July course would be perfect for me. Can you put me down for it now? Certainly, Mr. Peterson. Can I have your address, please? Twenty-six, Mayfield Drive, Orpington, Kent. I'm afraid I can't remember the postal code. Don't worry, Mr. Peterson. I'll check on it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten.
Now listen and answer questions six to ten. There are a couple of other things I'd like to ask. Certainly. What do I need to bring on the course? Well, apart from the obvious, you'll need our textbooks. I'll email you the name and publisher. You should be able to find it in your local bookstore. If you do have problems, call me or email me, and I'll see what I can do. We provide the computers, computer discs, translation exercises, and all that sort of thing, but you will need a good dictionary. We recommend Langenscheid, which is more than adequate for your level. You don't have to go and spend a lot of money on an expensive dictionary, not yet, anyway. Maybe you will when your German reaches a very high standard. That would be very nice. <laughs> Now, finally, what about the cost of the course, and how do I pay? Would you like to pay that in pounds or in euros? Euros would be fine. In that case, it's five hundred and fifty euros. You can pay by credit card if you like. Oh dear, I'm afraid I haven't got a credit card. How else can I pay? That's not a problem, Mr. Pettersen. You can pay by bank transfer. Fine. By the way, I forgot to mention I am a full-time student. Have you got a student card? Oh yes. Then that does make a difference. You'll be pleased to hear. You are entitled to thirty-five percent off the full price, and if you can persuade a few people to join you, it would work out even cheaper. How do you mean exactly? Well, for every five people you find, one goes free. In other words, if there are six of you, you get one free course. Of course, in reality, you would divide up the savings amongst you, presumably. Right. Well, I'll see what I can do. <laughs> Thank you. Not at all, Mr. Pettersen, and I'm sure you'll enjoy the course. There are, of course, sightseeing possibilities. Would you like me to send you our brochure describing them? Yes, thank you. I'd appreciate that. Anyway, thanks for your help. If I want to call back, who do I ask for? Susanna. I'm here most of the time. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute. To check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear the overseas student officer talking to some new students about the arrangements for an excursion to Ironbridge. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fifteen. Hello, everyone. My name is Pamela Sutcliffe, and most of you already know that I am the overseas student officer here at Salopian Technical College. Next Tuesday, the twenty-eighth of September, we have arranged an excursion for all new students. To the important historical town of Ironbridge, we are hoping you'll all come, because not only is the history of Ironbridge very important and interesting, but also an excursion like this is a relaxed and fun way to get to know each other. Ironbridge is about fifty-five kilometers from here, and we'll be travelling by the college bus, which holds forty people. 
If there are more than that, we'll bring a couple of staff cars as well. Though I might ask you to indicate on the list if you have a car and would be willing to take a couple of passengers. The list I'm referring to is up there on the student notice board. And if you would like to come on Tuesday, would you please add your name as soon as possible? By the way, could you please print your name clearly? I know some people have wonderful signatures, but often I'm afraid I can't read them, which can cause problems. So if we need extra transport and you could bring your car, can you tick the car column next to your name? Could you also add your student number and your telephone number, just in case there are any last minute changes and we have to contact you? The other information I need to give you is about lunch. There's a very nice little restaurant in Ironbridge which gives a 15% discount to the college when we bring groups. That means lunch is only about four pounds and they do good vegetarian meals too, so it's usually no problem for those of you on special diets. But if you prefer to eat your own food, that's fine too, either on the bus or in the park but I'd encourage you to try the restaurant. Now talking of costs, I should tell you that the bus will only cost you 10 pounds. And if you bring your car, we'll pay for the petrol. So you get a free trip in return for driving there. Will you please sign up by Saturday at 6 p.m. at the latest? The list is closed after that. We will depart at 9.30 a.m. sharp on Tuesday morning, so please make sure that you arrive at least 15 minutes before so that you can find a seat and get settled on the bus. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. The college bus garage is behind the engineering workshop. It's quite easy to find. If you come here to the student union building, then walk east down the avenue until you get to the childcare centre on your left, and then turn left and walk past the sports centre and the tennis courts, which are both on your left. Cross over Central Square and opposite you is the engineering workshop. Walk around the back and you'll see the bus. Please wear comfortable shoes as we'll be walking around Ironbridge and be on our feet for most of the day. Wear a warm jacket and you might like to bring an umbrella and a backpack to put them in if the weather's warm and sunny which we hope it will be, but of course we can't guarantee that. Certainly bring your cameras and any snacks or drinks for the bus journey there and back, which should take about an hour and a half each way. You should all check the notice board on Monday and we'll also put a note in your mailbox to confirm arrangements, so don't forget to check it. Now, why are we visiting Ironbridge? Well, Iron Bridge, as the name suggests, has got the original Iron Bridge. That is, the first ever Iron Bridge in the world. It was the birthplace of the Industrial Revolution, and for 40 years it led the world, as Britain changed from an agricultural society into an industrial one. It's hard to imagine today that this pretty, sleepy little tourist town was one of the most important places in England for over a century. Just imagine, 200 years ago, people from all over Europe and even North America came to Ironbridge to learn about what was then the latest technology. 
Today, it is listed as a World Heritage Site by the United Nations, as they consider the unique collection of industrial monuments, rank it alongside the Grand Canyon, the pyramids, and the Great Barrier Reef. One place that's fun to visit is Blist Hill, which is a reconstruction of a small Victorian industrial town where people are working and living as they did a hundred years ago. I hope you'll enjoy the day. It's been a very popular excursion in previous years, so I'm looking forward to going again next Tuesday. Now, don't forget to put your name on the list as soon as possible. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two friends discussing what to study at Mitchford University. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-seven. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-seven. Hello, Gloria. Hi, Paul. I just heard that you're studying psychology this year. At the moment, that's true. But to be honest, I'm not sure exactly what to study. You're in your third year at university. Do you have any advice for me? Well, it's a difficult question for me to answer, but I do have some ideas based upon my personal experience that may be of help. Anything would be helpful at this point. I'm feeling a little worried about what I should do. Well, there are a few things that I would recommend. Firstly, ask yourself what do you really enjoy studying? For example, maths, English, science. This will help you decide what course you should do. The university handbook lists all the courses available. You should take some time to look at it. A couple of my friends spoke with recent graduates of courses which took up a lot of time. Another thing which took a lot of time was an interview at the dean of academic affairs office. They're always so busy there. Unless you've got a lot of time, I wouldn't bother with either of those ideas. Okay, Gloria, I understand there are some excellent publications that I can look at which will help answer my questions. But the trouble is, I'm having a real hard time locating them. Do you know where I might be able to go? Yes, I encountered this very same problem when I was deciding on what to study. I managed to locate a few excellent books that really helped me to decide what was best for me. Now some of the details will be a little inaccurate. That's no problem. If you could just remember the titles, I'll be able to look them up at the university library. Now let me just get my pen.、Uh, okay, ready? All right. The first book I found was What Should I Do. It was written by Paul Smith, and I believe it was published in 2000 by Smith Brothers. I think this was the best book I read. Although Judy Newton's "Choosing University Courses" was also an excellent help for me. Can you remember what year that one was published? Hmm. Let me see. Most of the books I read were published around the same year, 2000, I think. I can't remember who published it. I think it was Printers Limited. You'll have to check that one out yourself. No problem. This is just what I've been looking for. Anything else you could recommend? Yes, there was one other book which I remember because my cousin works for the publishers Brown and Tate. He started there in two thousand and two. Anyway, the book's called Surviving University and was written by Julie White. It's an excellent book which came out in two thousand and four. I certainly recommend it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-eight to thirty.
Now listen and answer questions 28 to 30. Gloria, this discussion has been so helpful. I wonder if I might ask one more question. Sure. What would you like to know? Well, I'm wondering why you finally decided to study psychology. Well, what helped me to decide was my interest in working with people. I think that's what you've got to really decide in your own mind. Do people give you energy or do they drain you of energy? I asked my friends what they thought of my idea and most of them thought it was a good choice. Yeah, you know, I think my parents or family members who know me well would be a good place to start. Mm. I think if you like to research subjects, you might prefer to work by yourself. That could help you to decide what area you should study. For me, I like working with numbers, and I knew psychology involved a lot of this, so that also helped me to choose my course of study. The bottom line is you've really got to know what you naturally like to do. Once you work that out, you simply choose areas of study that relate to those things. Well, Gloria... I can't thank you enough for your time. Would you be interested in joining me for a coffee? That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a lecture on human civilization. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Today in our History Series lectures, Professor Smith is going to introduce the history of human civilization. Welcome, Professor Smith. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Do you know when human civilization originated? And what's the development of human language? Well, the first two stages in the development of civilized man were probably the invention of primitive weapons and the discovery of fire, though nobody knows exactly when he acquired the use of the latter. The origin of language is also obscure. No doubt it began very gradually. Animals have a few cries that serve as signals, but even the highest apes have not been found able to pronounce words, even with the most intensive professional instruction. Apparently a necessity for the mastering of speech is the superior brain of man. When man became sufficiently intelligent, we must suppose that he gradually increased the number of cries for different purposes. It was a great day when he discovered that speech could be used for narrative. There are those who think that in this respect, picture language preceded oral language. A man could draw a picture on the wall of his cave to show in which direction he had gone, or what prey he hoped to catch. Probably picture language and oral language developed side by side. I'm inclined to think that language has been the most important single factor in the development of man. Two important stages came not so long before the dawn of written history. The first was the domestication of animals. The second was agriculture. Agriculture was a step in human progress to which, subsequently, there was nothing comparable until our own machine age, Agriculture made possible an immense increase in the number of the human species in the regions where it could be successfully practiced. These were, at first, only those in which nature fertilized the soil after each harvest. Agriculture met with violent resistance from the pastoral nomads, 
but the agricultural way of life prevailed in the end because of the physical comforts it provided. Another fundamental technical advance was writing, which, like spoken language, developed out of pictures. But as soon as it had reached a certain stage, it was possible to keep records and transmit information to people who were not present when the information was given. These inventions and discoveries—fire, speech, weapons, domestic animals, agriculture, and writing—made the existence of civilized communities possible. From about 3,000 BC until the Industrial Revolution, less than 200 years ago, there was no technical advance comparable to these. During this long period, man had enough time to become accustomed to his technique and to develop the beliefs and political organizations to appropriate it. There was, of course, an immense extension in the area of civilized life. At first, it had been confined to the Nile, the Euphrates, the Tigris, and the Indus. But at the end of the period in question, it covered much the greater part of the livable globe. I do not mean to suggest that there was no technical progress during this long time. There was progress. There were even two inventions of great importance, namely gunpowder and the mariner's compass. But neither of these can be compared in their revolutionary power to such things as speech and writing and agriculture. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Thank you.